Well, Bob, thank you. Most of our audience are familiar with your extensive accomplishments, and I, I certainly want to touch on that. Um, I have immensely enjoyed our conversations in the past, and it's truly an honor to share this time with you around this event. Well, thank you. I'm, I love being asked my opinion. <laughs> All right, we're going to do that. So I'd ask, I'd ask if, if you might be willing to share a little bit of your thoughts on uh, Dirac's Park, um, quadratic versus linear equations. And, and I think part of this conference is to talk about a, a time machine. Um, you have mo one of the most impactful stories around that I've ever heard um, that is, it's mattered quite a bit to me. And so I was curious if you might be willing to share some aspects of that. Well, in the 70s, I, I lucked out and ended up at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center in, in Palo Alto. And I've come to review that, uh, view that as uh, having a time machine. So at Xerox Park, uh, we, were able to, we were building the office of the future. So uh, we created an environment that was the future. We traveled into the future. And, and for example, we, had, we decided to put a computer on every desk. And I know that's revolutionary. But in 1973, it was revolutionary. But we imagined in the future there would be a computer on every desk. So even though it cost $30,000 to put that machine on every desk, we did it. We pretended that it cost nothing and, uh, and built an, an internet of personal computers. So then in 1979, when I left Xerox, uh, I was in Silicon Valley. Of course, everybody there starts a company. I decided to start a company. And I had had the benefit of this time machine. I knew what the future of computing was going to be because I'd been there in this time machine at Xerox Research. So this gave my company a big leg up on the fierce competition that uh, exists in the Valley. And, and that leg up was since I knew what the future was going to be like, our company invested its uh, developments in a way uh, anticipating that future rather than diverging from that future. And as a result, we became a multi-billion dollar company. Yeah, I'm fond of saying that for a few nanoseconds in 1999, my company was worth 50, uh, inflation adjusted, $52 billion. And I didn't even get half of it. Anyway, that was a result of exploiting a time machine. So one of the tools of innovation is to suspend the constraints of the present and let your innovators live in a world of the future and see see what they discover out there, and then bring it back into the present. That's what we did at Xerox Research. And the importance of that story, of course, leads to the well-known Metcalf's Law. Um, and, and I think, importantly, your conviction, as I understand it, your conviction that uh, each node on that network would be worth more, because it wasn't conjecture. You had seen it in practice. Um, and could, could you? Talk a little bit about that and, and how you arrived at that and, and why you knew it to be true, <laughs> or at least had the so, high conviction. So in the, in the early 80s, there were hardly any personal computers. They were coming. I mean, Michael hadn't founded Dell yet. That was in, what's a 84. Uh, my company was uh, 79. And we were networking personal computers, but our biggest problem was there weren't any personal computers. And so we had, a, we had to navigate uh, through the mini computer world uh, and one of the problems was our customer networks since they didn't have many PCs were too small and so I developed a sales tool for my six-person sales force and this sales tool was a 35 millimeter slide that basically said the growth the uh, the cost of a network goes linearly with the number of nodes you're buying cards from my company to plug into your network and so the cost was linear but the number of possible connections you could make with n nodes was n squared so the and so i took the number of possible connections as a surrogate for value and argued that the value of the network grew as the square of the number of connections and so my salesforce said to our customers the reason your networks aren't useful is that they're too small of course. And, and the remedy to that, of course, is that you need to buy more of our products and, and grow your networks. And they believed us, and they did. And we went public in 84, and uh, the internet blossomed because of the power of connectivity. Fantastic. But shifting gears to Texas, um, you've been a Texan now for, I believe, over 10 years. And so I want to talk a little bit about your observations 
in terms of innovation over the last decade, where we go from here, um, and, and specifically about what it means to be a frontier economy. So I would suggest that Texas was, has been, is and will be a frontier economy. The future depended on the, the thought leadership and the investment in infrastructure and education and leadership that goes into that. When you think about what it means to be a frontier economy and what we need to do as uh, a state and a set of innovators in the state of Texas, both for the benefit uh, of, of this state as well as uh, the nation and by extension innovation leadership globally, um, what do you think about what is the next frontier and where do we go from here? Well, I was fortunate to be in Boston when uh, Route 128 was the Silicon Valley in the 70s. And then I had the good fortune to move to the next Silicon Valley, where I spent 23 years in the general vicinity of uh, Palo Alto. And I, uh, 10 years ago, uh, we moved to Aust uh, the greater Austin area because we sensed that this was the next um, boom town. And we were right because the last 10 years, uh, the greater Austin area has been a boom town and we've had the fun of being here. Uh, of course, my job was to enhance the uh, startup ecosystem of uh, greater Austin and then later broaden the charter to all of Texas. Because one of the things that you need in innovation is critical mass. And Austin and Houston and Dallas independently, just in, uh, by the way, I'm forgetting San Antonio and I'm forgetting College Station and oh God, I've, all the other cities I forgot to mention. But anyway, those three, uh, the bigger, uh, let's include San Antonio, each of them lacks critical mass. So it, it's, it's nonsensical for Austin to hate da Dallas and Dallas to hate Houston in the competition for startup innovation because all of us lack critical mass. So the networking of those uh, innovation cities is, is all should be the priority, not competition among them. In Silicon Valley, we call it co-opetition. That is fierce competition, but cooperation on certain things. For example, the making of standards or the investment in science are uh, aspects of co-opetition. Competitors should make those investments and then compete later. Mm -hmm. um, so the Texas has this great attitude. I, I'm sorry, it's just a, an attitude around here. And, and it's infectious. So even people who move to Austin immediately become infected with this <laughs> attitude. And it's a very, you know, it's that... Uh, uh, they make fun of it, of course, the, the, you know, how Texans brag, but it ain't bragging if it's true. And so the, <laughs> this, this whole uh, swashbuckling, wildcatting culture of Texas, which is manifest in politics, by the way, you know, there's no income tax, for example. That's a manifestation of this, of this swashbuckling attitude. So the startup ecosystem of Texas in all the cities, not just Austin, uh, is booming and it's great to watch. And now we're, we're entering new phases of innovation. I mean, so energy is ready for some big innovation and that's going to happen in Texas. Texas is the, the capital of energy. And as we move, so for example, geothermal energy is a very promising area. Texas knows how to drill and uh, drilling for heat instead of hydrocarbons is a coming thing and it's going to happen in Texas. So energy will be solved in Texas. Uh, and then there's a uh, uh, connectivity. So the internet has brought us uh, a lots of connectivity, so much connectivity so quickly that we now have pathologies. We have, for example, fake news as a pathology of connectivity. So we're going to work that out. We're going to figure out how to do news with all this connectivity we have. And the new internets are coming. The internet of things is coming. And that's coming out of uh, you know, Dell, Dell Technologies and Silicon Labs and so on. We have a lot of connectivity um, uh, in Texas. And then the third area, there are more than three, but the third area would be space. So the space is a new frontier. And, uh, uh, and here we, Texas is uh, playing a big role in that. I mean, I've been out to Firefly and I've listened to a rocket get tested. <laughs> God, is it loud. Uh, and it's, it's a completely different feeling than uh, developing five volt semiconductors. Uh, <laughs> but there is that same um, adventure, uh, uh, adventurous 
um, leaning of the Texas culture that I love so much. So uh, having been, so this has been my third stint in one of the innovation boom towns, Route 128, Silicon Valley, and now Texas. Uh, and it, that's where you want to be, and that's where we are. Yeah, the, the energy in those boom town moments um, it is tangible. Uh, I think you kind of suggested that before. You can certainly feel it in, in, in not just in Austin, as you, as you correctly suggested, throughout the state. Um, where everyone's got a role to play. And I'm thrilled that you mentioned the space sector and the energy economy. And with between uh, the Houston Corridor and ERCOT, Texas should be the test bed of energy innovation. And, and I absolutely hope and expect that as well. I wanted to go to your experience and time at the University of Texas and, and being around maybe some of the young people, entrepreneurs, founders, builders who are, who are watching this um, to glean some of the um, lessons learned and things they may apply, may apply going forward as we think about their careers and what they're starting out, whether it's in the state of Texas or otherwise. Um, are there certain observations you've had around being all of the, around all of those young people, maybe transitioning pre-COVID and into COVID that would be, uh, that have been interesting to you? Well, over the last 10 years, the University of Texas at Austin has built out an infrastructure for education in entrepreneurship and innovation. So there are courses for how to start. There's too many courses for how, how to start a company. I used to teach one, then I realized that everybody else was teaching them. I didn't need to. Uh, and so the, the, uh, uh, the startup infrastructure of the University of Texas is way enhanced over the last 10 years. Uh, now, one of the things that I've learned there is that undergraduate students don't know anything. They shouldn't be starting companies. This is a very unpopular attitude at the University of Texas. But my attitude is, if you're a, a, a sophomore, you shouldn't be starting a company. You don't know anything, and it, you have to know something to start a successful company. Of course, then the, this uh, does anything but annoy the students who say, well, we know a lot. And by the way, Bill Gates dropped out of college, and Michael Dell dropped out of college, and Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of college, and they name five people who dropped out of college and became billionaires. And then I say, well, name five more. And they have trouble naming five more because the, the statistics are not in their favor. However, I think what I've been doing is investing in uh, my time in enhancing the startups of professors. Now, of course, every professor has a flock of students that they bring with them, but the organizing principle of, of a startup around the successful research of a professor is, a, is more of a winning formula than getting freshmen to drop out of college to start companies. I do not advocate that. Got it. And speaking of investment in the future, I mean, we, we will, in all certainty, have extensive amount of federal infrastructure investment, some of that coming here locally. Uh, we also have a lot of local investment in infrastructure, R&D, education. Are there aspects of that that you, you think have particularly contributed to the ecosystem that we have today and we're continuing to build? Well, Texas is business friendly, and that trickles down to being innovation friendly at the university. You know, you know, the Silicon, uh, the Route 128 in Boston had MIT and Harvard and BU and 11, 11 research universities. The Silicon Valley, Stanford, Berkeley, uh, etc. And uh, we have the University of Texas. We have the 13 campuses of the University of Texas, the campuses of uh, uh, Texas A&M, uh, Rice, blah, blah, blah. So we have uh, research universities in Texas, and that's a you need that to have an innovation system. One of the uh, joys of living in Austin is that there's a path around La Lady Bird Lake. It's 10.2 miles long. And it's my Great. favorite walk. It takes me three hours, and I do around it. And I've been doing it for 10 years. So I've been watching the demographics of, the fe of my fellow runners and hikers. And there's two major demographics. You, you see military people doing their PT around the lake. <laughs> and that number's gone up with the Army Futures Command at Al uh, arriving here. The other group is, you know, uh, Oracle has opened their headquarters here on the uh, on Riverside. Yep. And you watch, there's a flock of uh, people out running who are all uh, clearly salespeople wearing spandex. <laughs> so the, the, the demographics of the, of the crowd of us who enjoy Lady Bird Lake is, uh, is shifting. Uh, the military has arrived, the uh, Army Futures Command is in force, and that's, 
that's stimulating a lot of innovation. And Texas is uh, greets the military with open arms. And that's not true in California or in Boston where there's a hostility to the military and Texas doesn't, uh, as an uh, overall rule, does not suffer from that problem. So we're welcoming the military and, and supporting in their needs for innovation. Yeah, thankfully so. And, and I wanted to go back to the, you mentioned the regulatory landscape and the, the ability that that enables the energy innovation, the space sector that's really growing here. And I had uh, thought of this concept of build free, right? It, it really feels like uh, for founders that want to come here or when, when we're, you or I are able to speak with the entrepreneurs that are building, let's call it industry 4.0 or deep tech opportunities um, that require uh, heavy lifts, uh, machinery, um, property, land, it, energy, uh, lots of energy usage, uh, really the industrial innovation that would power parts of the, the the, the important aspects of the next part of the U.S. economy, um, that build free concept really resonates with those founders. And, and they're rightfully uh, incredibly grateful when they get here uh, and embrace that, that, that uh, build free ethos. Uh, do you see that with some of the younger companies that you work with? We're building critical mass. We, we need role models. We need more role models. So we, we're, we use Michael Dell a lot as our role model, but we need a few more. Uh, and, we, and we get that by, uh, when I say we, that was an Austin reference, but we get that by tapping into Dallas and, and Houston and other places to, to find a critical mass of role models. There's also the support of science, which I think is important. I, I was amazed when I arrived to discover that the taxpayers of Texas voted to invest $3 billion in cancer research, the CPRIT program. Well, that's amazing investment, and if that's the taxpayers voting it. So that tells you the kind of people who live in Texas. Cancer is a problem. We want to solve it. What it needs is research. Let's put $3 billion to work there. It's an amazing uh, commitment to science. Speaking of role models, Texas has done a, a huge innovation in energy basically saving the U.S. economy in the last decade by developing uh, uh, horizontal drilling and, and fracking, the so-called shale revolution. The shale revolution is probably bigger than Silicon Valley in terms of the economic impact. And, and, uh, and Texas is where it happened, in that corridor around between Austin and, and uh, well, I think Houston was involved too. So the... Uh, <laughs> so there's a huge innovation example. So we had the secret and cancer. We have shale and, and energy. Uh, innovation is alive and well. It's fun to be here. Fantastic. Well, Bob, I know we have a limited amount of time, uh, but I, I uh, am, am so thankful that you created an opportunity for us to ask these questions, for you to share some of these ideas with the, the participants here at the, the Y Texas conference and anything else that you'd like to share or messages you'd like to deliver to that group. Well, I think uh, fear of missing out is alive and well, FOMO as they call it. It's People living thing. outside of Texas are wondering what the hell's going on here and a lot of them want to move here and they are and, and uh, I've watched the value of my house you know, you can watch it online <laughs> and I'm watching the value of my house go up and up and up and up as people decide to move here uh, as an indicator of attractiveness. The fear of missing out on, on the innovation uh, ecosystem here is uh, palpable. Uh, so welcome to Texas. Wonderful. That's a fantastic way to end. Thank you again so much, Bob. Thank you.